Good afternoon and welcome to this week's Market Mondays show. My name is Seng Yao and I'm again standing in for Dylan as he's still in Japan enjoying the final week of his summer break. Now the S&P 500 and NASDAQ slipped about 2% and 3.5% respectively for the week, marking their biggest weekly losses since uh, April. Uh, but on the other hand, the good news is that the Dow has advanced with a small gain, while the small cap focus Russell 2000 has climbed about 1.7% in the week. Now, the gap between the Russell Index and the S&P 500 has narrowed sharply, but still remains wide, with the S&P 500 up more than 15% year-to-date versus a gain of 7 and 7.8% uh, for the Russell Index. Now, while these developments suggest that market breadth is improving, which is supportive of sustaining the current momentum, it is important to watch the labor markets. Now, the unemployment rate unexpectedly climbed to 4.1% in June versus consensus of 4%. Uh, historically, when the unemployment rate starts to rise, it always and inevitably marks the end of the business cycle. Uh, in terms of results, Tesla and Alphabet will be the first of the Magnific Magnificent Seven to report on Tuesday. Uh, on Tesla, markets will be watching if the robotaxis will get a new launch schedule later this year. Initially, the launch date had been scheduled for August. Uh, on economics uh, data front, U.S. jobless claims will be out on Thursday, and the PC price index and consumer sentiment data from the University of Michigan survey will be out Friday. Uh, in today's show, uh, we will first be opening our panelists' conversations with a focus on the currency market and the Sing dollar. And my first speaker is none other than Satyandi Supat, who is Maybank's uh, head of FX research. Andy, welcome to the show. It's great to see you again. Um, let me first start off with the elephant in the room. Um, over the weekend, uh, with uh, Joe Biden's uh, decision to pull out from the presidential election, uh, the dollar has slipped in early Asian trading this morning. Do you think the DXY uh, dollar dex will continue to fall in the short term, which will be good for ASEAN FX? Uh, Andy, could I maybe have your take on this first point? Hi, uh, yeah, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, I think in terms of the dollar index, I think it has opened slightly lower. Uh, I think last seen about slightly above 104. Uh, in terms of dollar index, um, following the news uh, of uh, Biden's announcement. Uh, but in our view, I, I, we think it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, we still will have to uh, continue to watch how uh, polling uh, actually pans out, uh, especially in the run-up to the Democratic uh, com Democrat convention. Uh, I think on Trump's part, uh, he has said that um, Harris would be easier to beat uh, than Biden. Uh, and similarly, in terms of the asset markets, uh, treasury yield curves have actually flattened slightly as well. So I think if you look at it from a Trump perspective, uh, concerns about a Trump victory is somewhat um, not priced in, but uh, expectations of a Trump victory is much higher uh, in the markets, given uh, following the assassination attempt and um, given Biden's announcement. Uh, I think the accompanying uh, more inflationary environment concerns uh, as will probably support higher yields uh, and uh, I think DXY. So what we saw overnight is probably in terms of a knee-jerk reaction uh, in, in, in the run-up to the announcement. My, my sense is I think US election concerns um, will typically or historically tended to get priced in more um, from August onwards of the election year uh, and there is a possibility that the DXY strength uh, may start to pick up again uh, as soon as July comes to close. Um, and because of seasonality, usually July uh, also is seasonally stronger uh, month for the dollar index. So so that, that softness in the dollar, we think, uh, would eventually start start sort of unravel slightly uh, as we go proceed along into the end of July and into August. Uh, Sing Yao. All right. Well, let's uh, also take a look at the Japanese yen. Um, this is uh, quite an interesting uh, pair. I mean, the USD, uh, Japanese yen. Uh, as many of us uh, do know, the yen actually started the beginning of the year at about 141. And then it peaked at about 161 before pulling back to 155 uh, levels last week. What's your outlook for the yen and what are the implications on emerging market effects uh, like ASEAN currencies? 
It, we think uh, near term, I think dollar yen will be steady. But generally, we look at our view in terms of uh, over the next three to six months and even into next year, uh, we expect the pair to actually trade uh, at higher levels than uh, going forward. We, we're actually looking at dollar yen uh, and this third quarter at about 165. Uh, now it's about 157, 158. Yes, indeed. Uh, we started here about 141, uh, rose to about 161. It fell back to about 155 uh, around the expectations of possible interventions or possibly some unraveling of um, of the yen uh, short positions. Uh, but I think the the main story is this. I think in terms of inflation, in terms of uh, wage uh, uh, data, in terms of BOJ disappointing uh, at the last meeting in terms of uh, not slashing its bond purchase. Uh, and, and I think the uh, market is likely to feel more confident in extending the, that sh sort of... Uh, uh, short position going forward will continue in some ways. So we, we continue to see that BOJ is likely to only tighten at a slow pace uh, whilst the Fed easing is similarly likely to ease gradually uh, as well. So this differential between uh, Japan and US, we think will continue. I think uh, the yen's uh, carry pos funding position is also going to stay very attractive uh, to investors out there, especially as a number, uh, as a number high yielders uh, may choose to either keep um, rates elevator or even consider another hike uh, going forward as well. So in the near term, I think the risk of intervention is, we think is high, uh, especially if we hit towards the 165 mark that we are actually forecasting for, for third quarter. Um, so it, so in some ways, near term, steady about, about this 160 level, gradually move up to 165 by third quarter because of the fund, fundamental sort of situation. We think that the BOJ sort of um, uh, tightening would start coming in only towards October, possibly indicating uh, 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 in sort of um, some removal of the bond purchases uh, somewhere in July and uh, into August. Uh, but the cuts, uh, the, the, the hikes would only come in, in our view, probably only in October and uh, another one somewhere in the middle of next year. Okay. Well, let's take our focus back to the Sing dollar right now. Uh, a lot hinges on it. Uh, the strength of the Singapore market, uh, obviously, for one. And, and uh, later on on the uh, call, we'll be speaking with uh, Krishna again on the REITs market. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, a lot hinges, uh, to my point, is that a lot hinges on the Sing dollar. Do you still think this is going to be a star performer uh, this year, given all these developments that yeah, in interestingly, I mean, not interestingly, but I think it, it's as expected. I think Sing Dollar's resilience, I think, stands out. Um, uh, even with um, the, you know, CNY weakness, I think the dollar strength uh, and uh, movements in the global markets and global currency markets, um, I think Sing Dollar resilience is quite, uh, stands out quite distinctly. I think one one reason is probably because of the Singapore's uh, MAS's um sing dollar appreciation path sort of uh, uh, maintaining that path and policy and our view is I think in October I think the policy is probably going to be maintained uh, so essentially a sing dollar appreciation uh, sort of policy path will be somewhat maintained into uh, from October into October into the second half of the year uh, and I I think it, it's a it's a reflection of the concerns of inflationary pressures as well fundamentally. Uh, but uh, if you look at it in terms of the variations or uh, vagaries of how the currency will move, indeed it will move uh, if uh, dollar tends to strengthen or weaken um, or towards the end of the year, dollar tends to weaken, we think the SING would actually end the year closer towards uh, levels of about 134, uh, 133.50 by end of this year and then gradually strengthen even further towards 133 and 132 by end of next year. So, uh, if you look at it, we are incorporating the sing dollar resilience from a fundamentals perspective, but also some some form of dollar easing billing in into uh twenty twenty five. So yeah. Okay, and uh, on that uh, chart to my left, uh, could you just clarify that to your point about sing dollar's resilience, that the uh, sensitivity of the sing dollar against the Chinese yuan as well as the yen is probably the least uh, compared to the other Asian currencies. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so if you look at the um, correlations or sensitivity or beta, uh, it is one of the least uh, sort of uh, uh, correlated in terms of um, movements uh, more recently. I mean, this is for data from 2015 to 2024. 
Um, and then if you overlay that with some of the um, variations that you probably could see out of the yen uh, and the dollar, it is also one of the lower. So which suggests that I think there, uh, there is some element that I think there's um, differing sort of slight fundamentals uh, and also in terms of policy because uh, uh, Singapore's exchange rate policy is very distinct in some ways. We uh, allow interest rates to move, but our exchange rate uh, is uh, maintaining a sing strong sing dollar policy uh, makes us quite uh, resilient in some ways as well um, uh, yeah, going forward. Not to mention, I think globally as well, in terms of fiscal and uh, credit, sovereign credit uh, rating and um, globally in terms of uh, sovereign credit, I think Singapore stands out quite well because of its uh, fiscal surplus sort of position, uh, which uh, only a few countries have in the world, which keeps okay. it uh, well, attractive. Uh, but uh, there's only so much I think Singapore can uh, attract to keep it strong. So I think the, the worry for Singapore is probably in, during times of crisis will be how much tolerant will be uh, the Sing dollar to be uh, strong relative to the East trading partners. Okay, great. Thanks for that, uh, Andy. Thank you so much for your uh, for sharing uh, this morning. No problem. Thanks, Anya. You. Okay, my next speaker uh, will be uh, Krishna. Uh, last week, as you, uh, some of you would recall that we had uh, focused on FCT, we had focused on CICT, CLAR. This week, uh, Krishna has upgraded CLAR and MLT to buys and has, and he's also raised his target price for CICT. So I'm going to basically turn the camera to Krishna right now and ask him uh, to walk us through uh, why some of these upgrades were made. Krishna, hi, welcome to the show. Um, could you please uh, share with us uh, why some of the uh, optimism in some of these uh, stocks, please? Thank you, Sanyal. Uh, good to have once again in a week's time. So indeed, I think, as you mentioned, we have upgraded uh, CLAR and Maple Tree Logistics Trust to a buy uh, from hold. And we have raised the target price of CICT uh, to, from 2.1 to 2.25. Three factors why this has happened. And there is one additional factor for MLT. The first is for, uh, for the CLAR and CICT, it is the higher net property income you have a lower borrowing cost and a slightly lower discount rate from 7.4% to 7.2% because of how the bond yields have moved. As I mentioned for Maple Tree Logistics Trust, it is the additional impact of the appreciation of the regional currencies that we have factored in against the Singapore dollar. And that goes into the, it comes as a perfect segue to what Andy had mentioned earlier that he expects there will be some uh, depreciation and then appreciation going into the next year. So for CLAR and CICT, we have raised our DPU forecast by about uh, two, two, over 2.3 percent and 1.8 percent, respectively. Uh, this slightly higher change for uh, capital and ascenders is because they have the euro dollar debt in their mix, and where we have already seen one cut already. For Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, we raise our DPU forecast by slightly higher percentage, or 4.5 percent, uh, and a couple of percentage points for that has come from the assumed appreciation of the regional currencies against Sing dollar and also the uh, the FX hedging gains that they get uh, on, on, on the hedges that, that they put on the income side of things. So that explains, uh, you know, the changes that has happened for these two names and why we have upgraded uh, to buy and also raise the target price. Okay. So, yeah. Krishna, <clears throat> uh, aside from uh, SREITs, um, We've also noticed that the U.S. REITs have moved quite a fair bit. And in fact, there's a question from the floor uh, uh, asking uh, whether uh, the movement in the U.S. REITs uh, market is basically at the beginning of this cycle, uh, the mid-cycle, or probably closer to its uh, somewhere in between the midpoint and the tail end of it. Could you perhaps share with us uh, your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, it's a, it's a big sector. I mean, the US REITs, obviously, I do follow the IYR index. Um, and if you see over the last uh, probably four or five years, then the peak was at 116. Um, and I think now it was, there was a, quite a period of consolidation between 80 to 90. And then now it has like broken above that. Um, again, tracing what the yield curve has done. Uh, we think that we need to see a bit more of, uh, you know, the a trend formation in terms of the inflation 
growth outlook as well as the yield curve. Uh, we do see the sporadic moves and therefore we are seeing this kind of movement in the IYR index. Uh, but till we see a trend formation, I think uh, it will be more of a tactical uh, opportunities out there. Um, in fact, today itself, I believe that our fixed income team has uh, downgraded Singapore government securities to neutral uh, from previously a positive stance. So we can see that unless you know there is a bit more of clarity around uh, inflation and growth, uh, the environment is likely to remain volatile, and therefore there will be a lot of tactical investment opportunities on that side. Uh, I think I think that probably sums up both the U.S. side of things and as well as Singapore side of things. Okay, great. Thanks so much uh, for your uh, sharing, Krishna. Thank you, Sanyo. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Uh, my next speaker uh, will take us through um, uh, the, the stock Singtel. Um, some of you uh, will remember that last week, uh, Singtel has announced its support for the amalgamation of Gulf and InTouch. Uh, these are the parent entities of Advanced Info Service. Uh, which Singtel has a 23.3% stake in. Um, I'd like to basically invite uh, Husseini, uh, our telcos analyst, uh, onto the call right now. And my first question to uh, Husseini is um, uh, whether this deal is net accretive to Singtel's RNAV or breakup. Uh, Husseini, could you uh, share your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, th thanks, uh, uh, Sheng Yao, uh, for having me on the show. So uh, just from the numbers standpoint, uh, yes, it is positive for Singtel. Uh, the deal is positive for Singtel. Uh, Singtel will get uh, 1.7 share in New Gulf or the Nuco uh, for each for each of its uh, in-touch share. Now, based on our fair value computation, uh, it will be around 6% uh, accurate for Singtel. Uh, to hold a stake in the NUCO compared to its stake in InTouch. Uh, one other thing to note is that uh, NUCO's, uh, the new Gulf uh, earnings uh, and dividends are thinner compared to uh, InTouch. Uh, and as a result, there will be a 45 million per year dividend loss for Singtel. Okay, uh, but however, uh, it is duly compensated by around uh, around 122 million Sing dollar one time special dividend coming from InTouch ahead of this uh, restructuring. So net net from the numbers standpoint, uh, we see the deal as uh, slightly accurate or positive for Singtel. Uh, if we put the new fair value of uh, in touch in Singtel's model, uh, our SOTP would uh, go up by around one cent uh, for, for Singtel. So okay. net net positive. Okay. Well, I'm looking at your target price of 340 for Singtel. Um, it's about 40% higher uh, compared to the uh, today's um, uh, stock price. Uh, what other strategic implications are you factoring in into Singtel? Uh, for this uh, for this uh, level of upside. Okay, uh, so uh, our, our Singtel's uh, uh, buy thesis uh, is uh, essentially on three factors. First is uh, the potential consolidation in Singapore, mobile consolidation. Now, if you see Singapore as a small market, has three, uh, four mobile operators and 11 MVNOs. So in my view, the market is ripe for consolidation uh, and it could happen sooner than later. So that's uh, first factor. The second is the Optus uh, turnaround. So Optus from the core business of Singtel, uh, Optus is the largest component and we see there is a potential turnaround going on uh, wherein we have seen the price increases in in uh, in Australia, uh, the costs are coming down, CapEx also as well is coming down. So a potential turnaround in Optus is another catalyst. Uh, and uh, the, the final is the dividend. Now the company has, uh, uh, has declared a new dividend policy where they are going to pay 70 to 90% of their, uh, their, their earnings as regular dividends. And on top of that, they have announced around three to six cents 
in special dividends uh, coming out of various capital recycling initiatives company has put in place. So those are the key reasons for our uh, buy thesis on Singtel. Our SOTP is based on the NAVs of uh, various businesses uh, as well as the current target price, uh, current share price of Bharti Airtel. Great. Uh, Husseini, if I could just close off with one final question. Um, typically, when when uh, the markets look at Singtel, they always take a discount to its full breakup value potential of all of Singtel's uh, holdings. At 340, what is the discount that is being priced in uh, based on its uh, breakup value? Yeah, it, it's, a, uh, it, it's a good question. So at 340, our SOTP, we are taking a holding company discount of 25%. Okay. Uh, but if we see the current share price, in the current share price, the hold, uh, the whole code discount with the uh, street is imputing is around 40%. In my view, the 40% is unjustified. Uh, 40% I means if you look at the historical uh, trend, uh, it had been around 10% pre 2020. Starting 2020, the holding company discount widened to almost 40%. Uh, and in my view, the 40% is unjustified. We are around 25% holding company discount. Now, uh, one, one thing to add, uh, saying over here is that, uh, means uh, if we look at the Singtel's uh, market cap, it is around 30 to 32 billion USD, and they own 29% of Bharti Airtel in India. The market cap of Bharti Airtel is around 106 billion dollars. And the 29% stake translate to around 32 billion USD. Okay. So the Singtel's market cap is same as the stake they own in Bharti uh, in India, which means that if you buy Singtel, you get the whole other businesses like uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, the Singapore, Australia, data center, all for free. So there yeah. is a deep, deep value in our view. Okay. All right. So everybody, please remember, deep value on Singtel. Well, thanks, Usini, for sharing uh, on Singtel. And uh, we hope to uh, see you again uh, very soon on the stock. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you okay, my last speaker uh, is uh, Jarek. And uh, we want to basically talk, spend a bit of time to go over Dynamac. Uh, recently, uh, Dynamac has uh, issued a uh, positive profit alert. Um, and... Uh, uh, my first question to Jarek is basically to find out uh, in that uh, statement, in that uh, profit alert statement, what has surprised our analysts. So Jarek, hi. Uh, thanks for joining us on the show uh, this afternoon. Can you first talk us through uh, my first question in terms of uh, Dynamax profit alert and uh, what are some things to that, that that struck you? So, so I think in the announcement, they said that, you know, they expect... Uh... Uh, substantial gain in profitability la, in both revenue and also profit. So I think that is quite a good uh, positive alert. I think in the previous time they did that, the profit jumped by more than double. So I mm -hmm. suspect that you know, in this case, uh, for the first half last year, they did about 10 million. So judging from this case, they should do likely also more than double of what last year they did for the first half of 2024. So basically, okay. I think you know that's quite a uh, very positive alert. So that's why actually we actually revised our numbers upwards a few weeks ago, right? Because we thought that the margins would improve. But I, we do think that after this positive alert that we were actually still too conservative because, you know, this is now an upcycle that we've not seen in the last 8 to 10 years, right? So this is the first time this is happening in a long while. So that's why we decided to actually do some more channel checks and we realized that our margins were too conservative and we actually did, uh, increased our gross margins from actually about... 17% to 19% for its module business, which then result in us in lifting our profit numbers by 30 over percent for this year and next year. Okay. Well, aside from this rosy earnings uh, uh, outlook for the company, um, you know, there's also a fair bit of developments on the uh, shareholding front. Um, Hanwha Aerospace and Ocean, uh, this is basically uh, Dynamax's new substantial shareholder. Uh, Hanwha is basically accumulated collectively 27% stake in, in Dynamax so far. Uh, I'd like to ask you, what is Dynamax strategic value to Hanwha? 
And where does Dynamics valuation sit in comparison to peers at this moment? Sure. So Hanwha Ocean previously was known, known as the Daewoo Shipbuilding Group. So they were actually one of the top three uh, larger shipbuilders in Korea alone. right? So basically, I think they do build the whole FPSO. And for dynamic wise, basically they only focus on top side modules. So they are like a specialist in top side modules in Southeast Asia. I think they are one of the best in Southeast Asia. In Singapore, I think they are the best already because there's only left them and also Citrum. But Citrum doesn't focus just on top side modules. So basically, I think Hanhua uh, Ocean, if you read in the past announcements in a few months back, they have highlighted the that they are looking to grow organically and inorganically globally. So Actually, in two, one or two months back, they actually bidded for Austo, uh, the Australian ship builder, and did a GO for them, but they, it did not go through for various reasons. So after that, then they bought the, the Capo's uh, Dynamic stick from Capo. So we do think that, you know, uh, basically they do see Dynamic as a strategic and also uh, it fits into their business model because it directly correlates to what they do for FPSOs. So basically, there's also quite a lot of synergies through partnerships and also for example, let's say if a Hanwha wins a big FPS2 project, they can then sub the FP, the 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 FP, uh, top side module mod, the modules uh, to to Dynamax. And also then that they can also learn from Dynamax expertise in top side modules to be more efficient and also uh, get better margins from top side modules as well. Okay. But it's an interesting point on the uh, GO um, uh, from Hanwha. With its shareholding stakes currently standing at 27%. It's, uh, you know, very close, uh, not that far away from the 30% uh, geo trigger. What's the likelihood, in your in your opinion, of Hanwha actually increasing its stake to 30% and triggering that geo? I think, in my view, I think that it doesn't make sense for them to just stay a non-controlling shareholder. So if you look at it in a sense now, they are just a non-controlling shareholder uh, and they are still, and they are not also the larger shareholder in the company. So effectively, they can only do on a partnership basis, you know, for what's going to come going forward. And if you look at Hanwha's firepower and balance sheet, right, it basically, uh, it is actually a very huge uh, MNC, right, in Korea, one of the largest. So basically, I do think that you know it does more make sense for Hanwha to be a controlling shareholder for Dynamic in the future. And that would result in them crossing the 30% doing a GO. But in terms of, you know, pricing and all this, then I, I would say that, you know, it depends on how generous they want to be. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for that. Then we'll certainly be monitoring the uh, shareholder activity from an insider's perspective uh, from uh, today onwards. Thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing with us uh, on, on Dynamic uh, this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. So with that, uh, we've come to the end of the Market Monday show. Um, to our valued guests, again, thank you so much uh, for spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, Tillon will be back uh, next week uh, to continue with the program. And uh, we do look forward to taking more of your questions uh, uh, for next week. So with that, uh, thank you. And um, good luck hunting uh, in the markets uh, this week. Thank you.